Welcome to Target Market Insights, the multifamily and marketing podcast. Each week, John Kasman interviews multifamily and marketing experts to teach you how to find the best places to invest, attract investors, and grow your portfolio. You are listening to Target Market Insights with your host, John Kasman. Hey, welcome to Target Market Insights. I'm your host, John Kasman, and I want to thank you for joining us for another great episode. Now, if you're enjoying this podcast, do me a favor, leave us a five-star rating and review, and don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. Now, today, we're going to be talking to Ryan Holtz. Ryan is the proud owner of Ryan Holtz Marketing, a social media and creative agency, and he's the host and producer of a top 100 iTunes podcast called The Ryan Holtz Show, which focuses on business, entertainment, automotive, self-development, and lifestyle. Now, he's managed to have exclusive guests ranging from online celebrities to business thought leaders. Let's welcome to the show, Ryan Holtz. Yo, man. Thanks so much for having me on. John, I seen your uh, uh, one of your shows and, um, you know, I, uh, I really enjoyed uh, the interview and I thought, man, this guy's got some personality. You have a lot of knowledge. So again, uh, thanks for having me on the show. No, I appreciate you coming on, Ryan. Listen, I love uh, everything that I was reading about you, man, and just really getting to know some of the things that you've built out. You have a really amazing platform. For those of you who are watching on YouTube, as opposed to just listening to the audio, he's got a lot of fun, cool things in the backdrop, some sneakers, a helmet, <laughs> looks like a Toronto Raptors cap, and a bunch of other fun things. So we, we're we, got, have a great- we, we, we got the DDJ SB3 Scratcher. That's the Jazzy Jeff DJ controller that every, every old school vinyl head dj says <laughs> is a cheat so you you got him i appreciate you paying attention to detail <laughs> absolutely man absolutely so listen you kind of are, are a jack of all trades to an extent right entrepreneur speaker marketer podcaster why don't we just start by letting you talk in your own words how do you describe yourself to people you know it's it's really interesting you know i uh it's a great question i am um, you know i am a purebred entrepreneur in the sense of you know, I grew up from very humble beginnings. I like to talk about my story. Uh, I was raised by a single mom. I'm, I'm half J- Jamaican, half German. My mom is uh, German. I'm Canadian born. Um, and uh, my mom passed away when I was 13. And that, you know, was, was just a massive blow, which basically left me, you know, as an orphan at that time, which I didn't really think about. And uh, the wall you see behind me that you're, you're pointing out all the detailed stuff, is I call it my I am enough wall. And it's my wall that every time I look at it, it, uh, it gives me um, confidence and reinforcement when I have self-doubt. So you see the football helmet there. Uh, football saved my life, man. I mean, it taught me in, in many ways football because I started playing at 13 when my mom passed was, was my mom and my dad. It was my parents. It was my guidance. It kept me out of trouble. It taught me discipline. It taught me regiment. Um, and I kind of, you know, back then you don't think, oh, you know, I'm a, I'm a free-spirited thinker. You know, I'm an entrepreneur. Like, I don't, I don't label myself. I just said, I got to survive, man. And I got no help and I need to like get into this world and do something. And first, you know, course of action is I need to feed myself. Literally. I need to buy food. I need to make money. I need to provide a, you know, a place for myself to live. And I just started creating stuff, whether it was, you know, trying to get extra tips when I was driving a U-Haul and parking it to, skipping school and football practice to go work at McDonald's because I literally had to make some money. Um, and just being resourceful, you know, and in that it, you know, obviously fast tracked me to growing up at 14 years old. I felt like I was probably 24 years old because of the way my life was. And for everybody listening, it's not a pity or sob story. My mom, I had the best mom in the world. She, I still have traits of my mom at 35 years of age that she helped me with. So I had a loving mom, but you know, sometimes life happens. So the way I would describe myself is just a a very energetic, uh, entrepreneurial. Uh, I'm a father now. I'm a husband. Uh, I always tell people my family is first. And then after that, it's complete beast mode. Um, I love business. I love commerce. Um, and I love provoking people's minds, man. That's why you see on my podcast, the word, the main word is provoke. Uh, curiosity really is our mandate. I challenge people to think differently, to always question why if you're working at a job or you're working at this, or you don't like something or you love it, question it. Why? and ask yourself the question. So I like to instigate. I like to push. I like to antagonize. But most of all, man, I love life. I'm blessed to live life. And I want to live. 
love their story, man. And you talked a lot about feeding yourself, you know, and eating. So let's start talking about that, you know, from an entrepreneurial mm-hmm. standpoint. What was kind of that first business venture that you kind of created and talk a little bit more about kind of the impact that had for you? Well, uh, I, I think it, I don't know if I call a business adventure venture and I didn't really understand the impact of it, but at 13 years old, it's funny. I always like to keep my hair cut fresh with the fades and all that. And, uh, I said, man, you know, I like to cut my hair once a week. And I'm like, how much would it cost me for a haircut? So back then, of course, it's a lot cheaper, maybe like eight bucks. Now, I mean, fast forward with uh, appreciation, everything, <laughs> you know, that, that haircut's like 20 bucks, 25 bucks. And at 13, I said, okay, where can I save some money? What can I teach myself that maybe could potentially help me to save a little bit of money? So at the age of 13, I went and bought a, a wall clipper five star. And I uh, taught myself how to do fades. I bought some levelers. I spent like, at that time, I mean, still, you know, I was like, this clipper is like $125. Like, that was a lot of money for me. But I said, well, what could this $125 save me? And then what could I do with the money saved from the $125? Where could I put that? Anyway, fast forward, I saved the money that I would have used for haircuts for five years. So that's, let's just say, you know, let's say you're cutting your hair once a week, you know, let's say it's 20 bucks even. That's 80 bucks a month times 12 months. It's a thousand bucks a year. So from 13 to 18, I saved $5,000 and I invested that $5,000 into my first apartment condo flip at, at uh, 18 years old. And I tell this story because I said a haircut really did change my life and it really did uh, help me project, uh, you know, get me onto a path of thinking, you know, really smart financially. And I am a huge proponent of financial literacy because a lot of people really don't know as much about money as they should. And that's, that's not their fault. That's the school's fault. That's, you know, in, in every school, you should be teaching what is an investment? What is real estate? What is, you know, just the basics of paying bills, life skills, right? I mean, you know, much love to Shakespeare and all that crap, but that does not, you know, do you go out and land a deal, you know, to a potential client and talk about Shakespeare? You start talking about that crap, they're going to kick you out the door quicker than quick. You're wasting their time. You know, I need actionable skills, right? And this is where, you know, I, I do speak in schools and I'm, again, kind of an advocate where I, I say, you know, I'm not 100%, I'm not 100% on board with, with our schools, you know, and Canadian, we have great schools. But what we're teaching our kids, you know, a lot of it, it's not, it's not helping them for when they become an adult. So, um, again, another reason I wanted to do your show, I know you're into real estate and all that. I'm passionate about it because that stuff can literally change somebody's life. No, you're spot on, man. It's interesting. I was listening to, um, actually, I was watching a video, and it basically talked about the education the education system is set up to make employees, right? It's not set up to have people be financially free and independent. It's set up to, and I don't want to take this to a place where people misinterpret it, but it, it's really set up to be a funnel where you have people who are now trained to take orders to respond when a bell goes off to move on to the next thing. And you kind of keep them trained and, uh, you know, really in this regimen. And uh, that's really the point. It's not necessarily meant to teach the life skills, the independent skills, how to balance a checkbook, how to take a look at all of your expenses and, you know, budget and figure out what you do. I mean, you, you get to be 18 years old and most people have never even paid bills. They don't even know how to do some of these basic life skills. So it does become um, kind of daunting for a lot of people. And it's, it's interesting that we don't spend more time, uh, you know, really preparing young people to step into the real world and prepare themselves for, for what lies ahead. You know, I want to go back, though, dude, because I, I was a young hustler, but I never had the foresight that you clearly had. You know, I certainly <laughs> did not think about, all right, look, if I stop paying for a haircut, and teach myself to cut my own hair, the money I'll save, I can buy an apartment condo. How did you have, and I, and I know at 13, you probably weren't saying, all right, I'm going to do this so I can buy an apartment <laughs> at, at 18. Mm-hmm. But you still saved that money for something, which I think showed a lot of discipline and restraint that most 13, 14, 15 year olds simply mm. don't have. You know, it, 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 I do give a little credit. I think it's kind of a two-part answer. One, I think, I think sometimes genetics do play a role. I think who your parents were do seep into your bloodline. And my mom, you know, especially, you know, again, I only had 13 years with her, but when I got older and was kind of studying her road path, I found out that, you know, my mom was one of the most successful uh, first female um, bankers, you know, here in Canada for a bank called Toronto Dominion. Um, I uh, found out my mom owned a very successful janitorial company. 
Um, and you know, my mom actually suffered from mental illness towards the end of her, her, her road. And I mean, that really kind of, you know, put a pattern interrupt into everything, but she was a complete business hustler woman, you know, like she was a true definition of a, a lady boss, man. Like, and it made me, it makes me proud to, to call my mom that, you know, because it's, it's my mom, first of all, but second of all, you know, she's representing for, for women uh, who, as we know, with all the movements of Me Too and Black Lives Matter and all these things, you know, um, she was an OG of saying, like, I'm not going to accept the status quo and I'm going to go out and push. I'm not just going to stand at a sink and wash dishes, quote unquote, generalization, but you know what I mean, right? Um, so there's that part. But then the other part was, um, I just always thought there's got to be a better way. Like, I'm, I'm sitting in class here learning like bed mass or, you know, and times tables and chemistry and negative and protons and neutrons. And when I would, when I would go into work or work at the McDonald's, they never mentioned words like neutron or protons or, <laughs> you know, a customer never came up, you know, to the till say, yo, brother, I want a double, I want a cheeseburger or a Big Mac with a Coke and, uh, you know, a double, double of neutrons. And that right away, the moment that customer would give me money and I would take the money and put it in the till, it was like such a symbolic because I said, holy crap, this is real life. He's giving me money. I'm putting the money in the till. This corporation's making a lot of money off a damn cheeseburger. And it just clicked where I said, I don't know what I'm learning in school right now. And I'm not, you know, hey, and people listening, I'm, I'm a huge proponent for education. I, I learn every day. I got books and books always keep learning that, you know, so anybody listening, but our curriculum is, is really weird and it's behind and it's not true to what we're going through now. And this is why you're seeing like hustle porn and Gary V's and all these, you know, entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs are like rock stars now, but an, all an entrepreneur is, is a really terrible employee and somebody who thinks that there could be a better way or there could be a different way. And I think for me, when I was pressed with a lot of challenge, you know, and again, when I got to about 2021, I never, still never dealt with the death of my mom. So what I figured out really quickly, especially playing football, was I had a, I had a lot of anger inside me. When I used to play football, and I did very well, which probably because I was so damn angry, is when I would play football, like I was smashing heads, man. I was a running back, and I didn't even want to go around you. I wanted to run through your soul. And when I hit you, you knew this guy is not playing just football. Like, I'm playing life. And, you know, literally went, I went and sat down with a psychologist and I recommend everybody, if you got issues or anything, talk to a professional. And I invested my own money and I said, I got to talk to a psychologist. There's something inside me that is bothering me. It's, it's debilitating me. I need to get this off my chest. And I went for one session, literally, man, and it changed my life. She told me, don't come back. You don't have any issues. You have an, overact <laughs> you have an overactive brain. Go read this book. And if you ever need me, you know where to find me, but man, you're good and just deal with it. But uh, to answer your question, I know it's a long answer is, um, I think it's a matter of circumstance of life. I think there's a little bit of genetic and I think, you know, the good Lord above has blessed me with a lot of great things, you know, and what, you know, they kind of say, you know, Hey, he gave me, you know, for every bad thing I got hit, it was kind of set me up for the blessing that maybe was around the corner, you know? Absolutely. So we know businesses is something that uh, you've really focused on. I know you're heavy into cars as well. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about some of your other entrepreneurial endeavors. What are you, what else are you working on? So I got the, you know, the, again, the, the, the podcast, as you know, you know, when people say, Hey, I want to start a podcast. It's like, Whoa, Whoa, Whoa. That's a whole job in itself. Right. And uh, you know, I started the podcast and I said, I, I, I've done a lot of media contributions. So, you know, whether a TV station has me on, talks about the latest iPhone drop or, you know, coming on talking about, you know, any kind of, you know, charity or anything to do with kind of marketing. So I've always loved the TV and radio aspect in the media, but I can't speak for the U.S., but, you know, here in Canada, traditional media is definitely not what it was. Digital, online is where people are going. A lot of big companies are taking their advertising dollars from traditional TV, throwing it over into online. And again, you know, part about being a good entrepreneur is projecting the path, you know, and I always say a great entrepreneur is like a great quarterback. A quarterback never throws the ball to where the receiver is. He throws the ball to where the receiver is going to be right now. Everybody listening, are you throwing your business to where it is going to be 
or where it should be. And people need to understand that, you know, there's a difference and that's where the strategy comes in. Um, but I got the podcast, uh, you know, I DJ, um, uh, my wife and I are real estate investors. So we have properties. Um, I got the marketing company. Um, and I mean, that's, that's all I have time for at this point. And I'm, I'm a father, <laughs> man, and, and a husband. So, you know, again, right up my 24 hours of my day are pretty much spoken for. Love it, man. So I want to talk a little bit of real estate. I definitely want to talk more about marketing. And sure. If we have time, I want to talk about DJing too. <laughs> so, <laughs> Hell yeah. Hell yeah. From a real estate standpoint, what's your focus? What's the kind of your bread and butter? What do you look for in a real estate deal? Well, it's kind of interesting. You know, for me, I, I especially when I'm renting, if I'm, you know, because I'm a landlord, uh, I want small apartment condo style units. I'm always thinking worst case, I get a bad tenant in there. They smash up the place. How much would this place cost me to repair? Uh, because again, you can go through the court system and try to get money from the tenants. But if anybody's been in the real estate game, good luck with that. It could take forever to actually get money back. So yes, you can. But again, if your place is sitting there empty and damaged for a year, that's only going to hit your pocketbook, even if you're in the court and trying to get money. So I always look for things that I say, you know, cost of repair. Um, and I look for places that, uh, to be honest, I'm not a slumlord. I look for places that I would live in um, because it's just my ethics. You know, I like to know that uh, tenants are paying me money and they're paying me money for a great place that I would take my family and live in. And that just, you know, is different. And a hack for a great landlord, for people who are listening, every single year, Christmas time, we hand deliver a beautiful basket we pay for their Christmas dinner and we give them a discount on the rent every single December. And I cannot tell you what impact that has had on our business. Case in point, one of our place, a uh, hot water tank goes, my tenant takes it in their hands to actually go get a new hot water tank, get it installed, pay for it. And then actually call me because I was on vacation. And I just couldn't be a whole, they couldn't get a hold of me at the time. So don't worry, Ron, I took care of it. You know, could you just reimburse me the money? I knew, I knew nothing what was going on. My bad on that situation, but you know, just, just a mistake. So I just don't think people would do that if you don't treat them good. You know what I mean? Um, and I think, you know, again, kind of circling over into what kind of properties, the Airbnb stuff to me is really appealing now because uh, I look at what can I make for revenue putting one tenant in for a month and then what can I make on a property putting maybe some Airbnb people in there in a month. And I think that, you know, especially with Airbnb, how much it's evolved with their hosting and super hosts, you have some super hosts out on Airbnb. Not only are they making a lot of money, um, they're amazing. I mean, they're running that thing like a refined five-star hotel, right? Mm -hmm. So we're definitely looking at uh, location. Because we're saying, how much, you know, how many visitors does this city get? Or how many visitors does this market, market get? Because a lot of Airbnb people, and again, an Airbnb hack out there, and I put a video on YouTube, is I get very suspicious of people who want to rent my Airbnb that live in the same city. Because that tells me you want to party. That tells me that you want to basically not mess up your own place and you want to come mess up my place. So most of our customers are from out of market. So how many people visit this market is very important to me because I look at the substantiation of the Airbnb, right? Because a lot of our stays are going to be either people are coming for work on a regular basis. People are just coming to, you know, have a night in the city, you know, a couple nights and just want to chill. Um, so those are, those are factors. Uh, I don't do any single family homes, it, you know, and I know I, it scares the hell out of me. Uh, and I know there's a lot of seasoned investors out there, but I just think, Oh my God, damage it and maybe the wiring is old and then the code the inspector comes and says well ryan you know now that you're renovating you need to get it up to this code and i mean there's so much money that could be bled out with a freestanding home including landscaping and any kind of issues that are foreseen uh I, i'm comfortable with boxes i guess is what i'm saying i like things that are apartment style condo you know i will maybe touch a town home but again nothing too big i like for me i like to stay in the thousand to you know at most 1400 square foot range that for me is just kind of been my bread and butter line yeah i think to your point it's like uh you know if you have something that is you know condo quality you're attracting high quality whether it be tenants if they're staying you know for a long period of time 
or if you're doing Airbnb model uh, guests, right? Because you want people who are going to care for the property, mm. it makes the the uh, the repair, the the uh, the effort that goes into it fairly easy to manage. And mm. uh, you can screen very easily as well, right? You can go ahead and you can cherry pick and you can get really good residents versus, you know, if you're going to, um, you know, whether it be single family houses or you're going into more of a, you know, C class or D class type neighborhood or, or property, you may have other expenses. And the point you made about not knowing what's behind the walls, if you start getting into renovation, mm. that's a real thing that you need to understand, especially when you start getting into the colds and you're doing renovations. So, you know, if you want to kind of make it where it really is just about getting great quality residents and, you know, cash flowing, that's a great strategy to have. Just go in, don't worry so much about renovations, just get good quality tenants and then manage it from there. Let's fast forward a little bit more. You know, I want to talk about some of the stuff that you're doing more in the automotive space and social media space. I know you kind of have a background working with a Ford and working mm -hmm. with them on some of their social media. Talk to me about how you got into it and maybe kind of what you've been able to do over the last few years. Well, this, uh, I, I started, so if I circle back, yeah, when I was 24 years old, that's officially when I opened up my first business, which was a online marketing and video production company. And at that time where I'm situated in Canada, cause I live, I actually have two, two family homes. So I have my home that I'm talking to you from where I have my studio and office, which is in British Columbia. And then we have our other home in Edmonton, Alberta, which is just the adjacent province over. Um, but at 24 years old, you know, playing football, those are the last cleats I played with up there with the Gary Vaynerchuk book um, over over them. They still got blood on it from somebody else, which I'm very proud to say. Um, uh, I said 23 years old, I said, okay, at that point, I had an opportunity to play CFL football, um, which is professional here in Canada. But it's basically where we say all the people who couldn't cut in the NFL come up. All the American dudes, they all come up and they go to the CFL. And uh, that's just the way it is. But we've had some great people anyway. Uh, and I said, do I want to go and kill my body? and make almost no money because they did not pay well. Um, and a lot of them have second jobs or businesses in off season. Um, or is it time to start a business? And at that time I was kind of starting a business. You know, I, uh, I was playing ball, still having this company go uh, kind of growing, but I never called it a company yet. But one day, all of a sudden I landed a deal and it was $10,000. My first deal I landed and it was from an oil company. And they said, can you come do, an instructional video for us. And at that time, 10 grand was a lot, like it was good money. I mean, man, you know, first, just imagine you start a business and your first interact transaction, 10 grand. You're like, oh, okay. But for me, and again, this is where I think other people have to use this too, is I don't get high and I don't get low. I don't, when I get a deal, I'm like, oh, I don't, I, I, I'm like, I'm happy, I'm grateful. Cause I know right behind that deal could be a punch in my mouth. So when I get the punch in the mouth, it doesn't sting me as bad. And then when I get a good deal, it doesn't sting me as bad, if that makes sense. Helps, mm -hmm. helps keep me level, keep me clear. But 24, started the first company, uh, did well. And, um, I, you know, I, I think back and I'm like very blessed for that. So anyways, I ran that company, grew it, sold it at 27. And then fumbled my thumbs for a year, kind of saying, what do I want to do with my life and, and all these things? And uh, I took a job at a Ford dealership uh, and uh, literally went in there and said, I know nothing about the car business. I know nothing about, I'm not a gearhead. I mean, I love a nice vehicle. Don't ask me like what cylinder or anything like that. You know, I'm like, yo man, I just like my black rims. I like it blacked out, I like my tint. Um, you know, it's just how I roll. Um, and, uh, but the owner, you know, kind of a youngerish guy. And he said, uh, I said, I don't know the car business, but I know people and I know humans and I know marketing. And he said that you're hired. And I said, okay. And he said, well, by the way, we're going through renovation at the dealership. So we're actually, they have all these little modular homes because the actual structure is still being built. And uh, he brings me through a tour. Dude, literally there's like ceilings hanging down and electricians are wiring. And I'm thinking to myself, what did I get? Whoa, whoa. I mean, what am I marketing here? Like, oh, this is not, you know, I'm thinking and I'm like, okay, okay, whatever. So I started off in the dealership that wasn't even a dealership. They had all the cars on the lot. There was no physical showroom yet. 
Um, and I said, wow. So anyways, fast forward, took the job and I started using Twitter. I said, I need to get people to care about our dealership. So I started doing campaigns on Twitter, like share your story where we would support local businesses. So if a customer took a picture in front of a local business, tagged our dealership, we would give them one point. And then at the end of this one point, you were going to win a car. So we actually gave away a car in the end. Um, and it was called the share your story campaign. And, um, so anyways, we, I said, we're going to create the share your story campaign and we're basically going to take, uh, five contestants that get the most votes that we solidify from all the stories that were shared. And we're going to give this car away at our grand opening when the renovations are done. Anyways, we got so many votes over, it was like something like over a million votes. Um, and we casted uh, the top five people with the most votes and we gave the vehicle away at the dealership. Fast forward, it did so well that Ford themselves wrote a case study about it. And then right after that happened, this is only six months of me being at the job. And then right after that, uh, have you seen that movie, The Blind Side with uh, right. Sandra Bullock? Mm -hmm. So the big black dude, uh, he was on Twitter saying, oh, I'm coming to Edmonton and you know, I'm gonna be doing kind of like a little press tour. So I actually messaged him on Twitter and I said, hey, if, when you get to Edmonton, we'll give you a free loaner car if you just give our dealership a shout out. He actually got back to me on Twitter. So he came into the dealership, took a tour of the dealership. Every news station he went to, he gave us shout outs. And then, he, you know, I even partied with him at the club the night after. He said, Ryan, you know, if you want to come through the club, no problem. I'm, I'm like, okay. And it was, it was, sur I got, I was surreal. You know, I think back and I'm like, man, I just got this job. And I'm like, what? I'm sitting in this private roped off area from a tweet that was great. Anyways, so the ultimate came when Twitter said, what the heck is this dealership doing? They're selling 20 to 100 cars a month just from Twitter and the leads going on. Twitter wrote a case study, put it up on their website beside Barack Obama's presidential campaign at the time and also Coca-Cola. And attached in that case study was the dealership's name and my name. And that gave me a whirlwind of press and media and the automotive community said, who the hell is this guy that has only been at this job as a marketing internet director for eight months? Fast forward four months later, I said, well, entrepreneur cap just flipped on. I see a gap in the market. Time to open up Reinhold's marketing. And, you know, people thought, man, this guy hasn't even been in the automotive for a year. I took it out and I wrote my own courses on how to market inside the dealership. And I sold this course to every single automotive association in Canada. So provincially, I went over to different provinces, which is equivalent to a state. And I started training their dealers on how to market inside the dealership. And that just propelled me, you know, articles were written and I mean, I got hundreds of articles and TV stuff and, you know, I, I can't even keep up to it. I, I created a media kit and I'm like, I don't even know what to put in there, but I, you know, I'm going to put in a few things and then people can go on their own thing, but that's it, man. And, um, went out and then I started getting uh, dealer clients and stuff like that. Then I started speaking at conferences. You know, I spoke in L Los Angeles, spoke Dallas, Toronto, Seattle, you name it, man. And, uh, the rest is history. That's amazing that you were able to accomplish so much so quickly. You know, you come in six months on, and obviously you had some knowledge on social media, but it's not that you were running a bunch of campaigns prior mm. to coming to the dealership. So no. Coming in, kind of figuring out the landscape, and you kind of really hit it big. And there are people who do this full time, have been studying this for, you know, a long period of time and did not have that kind of success. So you really were tuned in with what works on Twitter. You know, for our listeners right now who are trying to be, more active on social media and trying to leverage social media to build their brand, to drive more engagement, to ultimately get more leads. Give me a couple of tips or a couple of things that you see that people should be doing and maybe one thing that they should stop doing. People, I mean, here's a poll quote and, and Gary Vaynerchuk said it the other day, but I, I agree with it. He just said it better than I could. Strategy is a disguise for non-action. Okay. Everybody's trying to get their strategies together, clean it up, you know, make this perfect, make this right. It's just a disguise for non-action and fear, right? There is something so beautiful about going in, okay, to a situation and just going at it and then figuring out what mistakes you made afterwards because it's real life experience 
I, I, I want to pull up this. Uh, I wrote this. I was in bed last night. I woke up in the middle of the night and I put in this, this quote. Because this, this, is, this is what I came up. This is my quote. Because I always have these things in like 2 a.m. The cost of failure is nowhere near the cost of trying. Think about that. The yeah. cost of failure is nowhere near the cost of not trying. I love it too. And, and the thing that's powerful <laughs> about that too is that even if you fail, you learn and you know what you can do better, you know what you can adjust and you now have experience. And if you don't try, you kind of kill your dream and you kill any potential momentum before you even get started. So that's, that's very powerful. And for everybody listening, and I'm going to answer your question, there's a book up here. It's called Laws of Human Nature by Robert Greene. If you're in business or you want to understand people, I don't care if you own a business, you have a job, you don't have a job, you don't have a business, wherever you are in life, this book is like a Bible. It, it, it breaks down why humans do what we do, why we think what we think, why our egos uh, or pride get in the way of things that could be really good for us. It basically undresses all your garbage and your crap that you think people care about that they really don't care about. You know, I did this uh, experiment, right? And I, I, I said, why does Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg always wear the same outfit, right? Uniform mentality, always the same clothes, black shirt, hoodie. And it was so they did not have decision fatigue. And when I heard Mark Zuckerberg talk about why he wears the same outfit almost day in, day out, he said, I don't want to think about what I have to wear every morning because I have so many other decisions in my life that I want to put my effort and focus into. But he said, Nobody cares. They only care what you can do for them. Marketing is all about what can you do for your audience. That's why I used to come out with the whole, I'm an award-winning, internationally recognized marketer and all this stuff. Nobody gives a shit. All I need to say to them is, here's what I can do for you. What is your problem? How can I help you? You, 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 you. That's it, man. So. People who are marketing, when I came to the dealership, dealers, I, I, I can't speak for United States, even though I've spoken at a couple conferences, but I can speak for the dealership community here in Canada. The average dealership is not loved. People don't think of a car dealer as like this heavenly place. They think they're going to go there and get screwed over. That's a lot of what a lot of people think. The dealership that comes out and says, no, 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 no. I want to rewrite that, that way of thinking that you have. I'm going to be very transparent. We are going to educate you on what we do with your car, how we sell your car, how we service your car, how we take you, how we trade your vehicle in. I'm just going to educate you on the whole process. You are immediately building trust. You're immediately building authority. Things like new owner nights, right? When you bought your vehicle, did your dealership send you a message saying, hey, man, we're having a new owner night. We're going to teach you how to change your own tires, how to change oil, the maintenance of a vehicle, and we're also going to give you free dinner. You come from uh, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m., my man. And we're going to teach you a little bit about your car and we're going to feed you. Could you imagine, you know, like you're not going to leave. Even if that dealership is more expensive, you're not leaving them. You're not going to. And, and, and yes, of course, some people will. But the retention of your business is going up, right? Another example. On your first year of buying a vehicle, you know, most dealerships send you out service stuff. Hey, man, it's congratulations. You've had your vehicle for one year. So because it's a piece of crap, you need to bring your vehicle in for servicing so we can charge you some money and then, you know, take care. Or the dealership could say, according to our records, happy birthday on your new whip. Happy birthday. Congratulations on your vehicle. Attached to this email is a gift card for $10 for Starbucks. Coffee's on us today. Right? <laughs> Nobody cares about employee pricing or we pay what you pay or any of these gimmick crap. What can you do for me? So people who are listening, when they do marketing, who is your product or service for and why you? Who, why? If you can answer those two questions, center your whole marketing around who needs your product or service and can benefit and why you? And the why you portion is probably the hardest part because it actually makes you think about not yourself, but the customer. Right. If I'm on a podcast with you right now, this is really fun because it's nice to be interviewed instead of interviewing. Right? right. But could you imagine I sit down and talk with my guests and I make it all about me? I mean, come on. And then and then my my audience isn't going to benefit from that at all because I made the whole podcast about me. So when I sit down with my guests, I make it about them. And if my guests ask me questions about me, I, I love to answer because 
you know, a lot of people do come and say, well, I also want to hear about you, Ryan. And I'm sure your guests, they want to hear about you because they're listening to you. They want to know you, right? But we, we start, we both, you and I started this podcast to not uh, just sit here and talk about us. We made this podcast to bring value to people who are listening to this podcast, right? And I always tell people, they're like, Ryan, you got a podcast. I don't give a crap if you call it a pod shit, a pod butt, a pod, <laughs> a pod group, a pod hit. I don't care. It's a show and it's two goals. And I'm two goals for our show is one, bring value to our guests and listeners and audience. And the two is to make guests feel like they came home. When a guest sits down on our show, they, they get deep. I want them to feel like they just came home and they smell that cookie when they came through the door. They don't even realize they're in an interview. Oprah Winfrey, Ellen DeGeneres, um, David Letterman. These people are some of the most brilliant interviewers that will ever live in our, in our world. When you see them sit down and talk to a guest, it ain't, an, it ain't a job interview. It's a conversation between two friends, right? So when you market, you're not marketing to an animal or an item or, or a thing. You're simply talking to your customer saying, I'd like to try to help you out. Yes, I'm trying to make some money because I need to be profitable. I'm not going to lie about that. But here's why I can help you out. Would you take some time to check out our thing? Pull back. Yeah, you know what? Sure, I'll check it out. Okay, well, you know, here's this, this, and this. Let me know if you have any questions or how I, how I can be of assistance to you. And if you do that, you're going to convert at a high rate. Sure, some people are going to say, just leave me alone. Don't bug me. That's okay. But when you take that approach, man, you keep doing that, that's going to start compounding over time. Marketing is all about humans. That's it. Man, that's just phenomenal insight right there. I mean, and it sounds uh, simple in the fact that what you said is, is it makes sense and it's straightforward. But so many people um, really struggle with that concept. And, and the illustration you gave on the one-year anniversary of buying the car, I think for anyone in any business, whatever widget you sell, whatever you do, that's something that is applicable. You know, when you have someone who has come into your business, um, you could go and try to sell them something else a year later. Hey, come get this oil change. Time for an oil change. Or you could acknowledge and celebrate the time that you guys had and offer them something as a celebration token. And then obviously that naturally is going to provide an opportunity if and when they do need that oil change. They know their oil schedule. You don't have to tell them it's time for your oil change. Uh, mm. But that definitely gives you a way to connect with them and build. You know, the word I like to use is care. You know, when you mm -hmm. show that you care, um, that allows you to take business to a different level versus, you know, you just showing up because it's convenient for you or there's something that you want to get. So I love your point. You, you asked the question, who needs this and why me? And if you can answer those two things, you really set yourself up for a great relationship as a marketer. Well, and remember, remember, people want to be informed. They want to be educated or they want to be entertained. There's no, there's no other thing that people are consuming. They want to be informed. They want to be educated or they want to be entertained. They're, like anything you do in your life, when you open up your, your smartphone or you, you know, flip up your computer. Do you, have, do you have kids, by the way? I do. I've got two boys. They, oh, there you go. You're dad, man. So, I mean, you know when, you know, in hashtag dad life, man, we, we're doing it. And it, that <laughs> is the biggest, that is the most important role you'll ever play in your life. You know that already. I, I, once I had my kids, I said, oh, my God, this is, it takes it to a different level. You know, I, I'm proud of that. But everything we do, if we consume anything, it's either you want to be informed, you're trying to get educated, or you want to be entertained. So when companies are, are trying to, you know, circle their strategy around getting new business, maintaining business, or retention, whatever their goal is, those are the three things. Those are the three pillars of content. So you need to decide, you know, where does your customer fit in? Well, there's nothing wrong with a dealership that's made some money from you that's now trying to entertain you. You know, why doesn't a dealership come out and say, hey, man, you know, I know you got two kids. We made a funny car seat video or we made a funny video about, you know, this latest uh, trend that's happening with kids or TikTok. Hey, show your kids our TikTok and it's all PG, just fun, man. You got the owner, owner of the dealership on TikTok just messing around saying, hey, man, like you would actually look and be like, is this guy really doing this? And you might think this guy's weird. But I promise you, like later on, you're going to be like, that's freaking awesome. 
Like, I love that. I respect this dude even a little more because he's a real dude. He's a real or, or a woman, whoever owns the dealership. You know, it's like, just use it. Use the platforms for what they want. People who are listening to your, your show, a question I get asked all the time, well, I don't really do social media. Which platform is right for me? I mean, if I had a dollar for every time that question came up, people think about social media as like, which one? And I tell them this. Here's an example. When you get up in the morning and you want to put on clothes, and I'm trying to take on the uniform mentality. I got my, got my gear. I like, I, liked, I like fashion, man. I like my style. But I got my staple pieces. I don't want to put a lot of thought into it. I used to wear a suit every day. Anyways, when you get up in the morning, you're going to say to yourself, what's the weather outside like? If it's really cold, well, you're probably going to say, well, I'm going to, you know, maybe layer up or wear a sweater, long pants. I need a coat, but a thicker coat. You're going to assess what you need to wear for the weather. So when somebody says, what tools do I need to be on for social media for my business? Think of them as tools. Twitter is really good for this. TikTok now is coming on, very young demographic, but that's very powerful. And you're getting massive organic reach. It's not like Facebook where they said, boom, you know, now you got to pay to play. Or you got Instagram, or you still got Snapchat lingering, or you got YouTube. You have to say, what's my goal? Who do I want to talk to? Okay, I want to talk to this person. What's their age? Okay, this then, household income. Well, based on the social media platforms, Instagram. This is where I think my audience mostly is right now. Let's focus on Instagram, try to master Instagram, and then we can maybe build out. Don't come on all the platforms. And for the love of pudding, do not, do not say the same message with the exact same copy and graphic on all platforms. They're all different. You cannot go to China and speak, um, you know, Swahili. You cannot go to Kenya and speak like Chinese. You need to speak the language in which uh, the person you're talking to or want to talk to understands. So again, just maneuvering where you want to go and then what car social media is going to take you to the destination. Ryan, great tips. Are you ready for a bullseye round? Yes. All right. Let's How go. has a failure or an apparent failure set you up for later success? That's the, that's the story of all my success. The success wasn't actually the success. It was really the failure. I mean, um, oh, God, there's, you know, I, I mean, I fail every day. Uh, I would have to say, though, um, the failure, you know, I feel not necessarily mine, but my mom, what happened to my mom in my childhood, even though it looked really meek at that time, set me up for everything. It's actually my biggest blessing. You know, I, I interviewed somebody the other day and he said, you know, Ryan, um, when my back's against the wall, I put that wall on like a backpack and I just keep going. And I mean, think of the visual on that. Like, you want to come at me? Come at me. Go ahead, man. Will Smith says it. You get on that treadmill, you better be ready to die. I'm going to die running on that damn thing, right? My mentality is so, you know, once I make a decision, and I'm kind of a chilled out dude, but I kind of have, I got two switches. And I do that purposely. I'm very relaxed. If everybody knows me, I'm always smiling, funny, high energy. And I'll brainstorm about something. And people think, oh, Ryan, you just kind of, you're somebody that just executes and rushes to decisions and gets it done. Yes, but after a lot of thought. I could ponder something for a year. But the moment I say, that's it, now we're playing football. Middle linebackers coming up. Sam's coming up. Will linebackers coming up. Free safety's back. They're ready to take off my head. I'm already assessing, right? I'm assess I'm looking at your eyes right now. I want to see your fingers. I'm figuring out who's the weakest person in this chain. This guy's trying to yell and act like he's bad, but I think that real, he, really deep down, he's got mommy issues. This guy over there, I see how he's trying to look so good, but can this guy get gully in the, in the thing? I'm already assessing the situation. And once that, that gun goes off, man, it's like a pit bull out of a chain. There's just no going back. Race horses have blinders on so they stay focused, right? So that's what we're doing over here. That being said, before we make that decision, we put a lot of work, effort, knowledge, studying and preparation into that. But once we make the decision, if we're gonna go at it, and I'm fully willing to fail miserably at it, 100%, like fail so bad it's embarrassing because I'm going at it, because then I can live with myself. You know what I'm saying? But you go so, hard, yeah. I go hard, gotta go hard. You gotta go hard. Look at look at who's at. Look at your competition, man. 
you got some, um, I have respect for humanity. There's amazingly brilliant and hardworking people in this world. They will kick your butt, man. If you don't come at them 100%, you're done. That's the truth. All right. What is the book you've recommended or gifted the most in the last year? Uh, there's a couple. Laws of Human Nature, Robert Greene. That's number one. Because uh, it's a it's a really heavy read. And I, I read it four times. Audio book, physical book. And I still try to wrap my head around it. Ego is the Enemy by Ryan Holiday is a book that I think is... Uh, you know, uh, just great. Back when I was at the dealership and I had all my success though, Gary Vaynerchuk wrote a book called The Thank You Economy. That book changed my game. Um, and it's funny because he talks about crush it uh, and Thank You Economy, if I, and I could be paraphrasing, but I, I believe he said was not his most uh, selling book or his favorite book, but he loved that book. And he said he was shocked that it didn't do as good. And I don't know what the numbers are on it now, but anyways, that book for me out of all his books was the one that it taught, it just teaches you to get out of your own way. He's like, thank you. I read the book and I literally showed up at the dealership the next day. You know what I did? I just started showing gratitude. Anybody who would follow us on Twitter, thank you so much. How can we help you? Give us your sales. Give us your sales. A local cupcake lady, imagine this. She sent us her own graphic. I tweet it from the dealership account. We'll retweet your stuff. Another one, we'll retweet your stuff. They were dropping off cupcakes. We have people coming to the dealership like we were just like this like messiah. And people were like, what the heck? Like, why are people just showing up giving gifts at the dealership? Is this like a charity thing happening? No. Ryan's on his Twitter doing some stuff from it or whatever. And people used to call like Twatter and Twitter. They didn't even know what the hell it was, right? So, you know, it was just immediately showing gratitude. Ryan's on Twitter doing something yeah, <laughs> right. yeah they're like that water <laughs> and that's right, exactly a, what was said <laughs> right <laughs> give me a digital or mobile resource you recommend for your business uh i love well one app i absolutely love and maybe you can even give me some too because one thing that i find is i have an extremely overactive brain so um, if I don't write something down in my notes or take a voice memo, like it will be forgotten. So I use Evernote a lot, which I think is just fantastic. But given that we're really trying to apply a lot of systems in our business and structure, I use a lot. Now we're heavy, heavy into Google Drive. Um, just because of the robustness of it, the docs, you can literally type in a doc with your teammate at the same time, team member. Um, and the one app, and I call it the bonus app that everybody needs, is called Pocket. Pocket is amazing. If you see an article or a funny video or a quote, you literally just click on it, share it, and add to Pocket. You go into this app, it just lists everything you've added. It's absolutely amazing because if you see an article or you come by something, Pocket is really, really great. Uh, Google Drive, uh, uh, amazing, right? Um, one skill I would tell everybody to, to learn that is a skill that I, I don't like that I have because I don't necessarily enjoy it and I never did even when I had my online and video production company is, and we do offer the service now for clients, is video production. Um, video production has been my blessing because I can record the podcast, I can chop it up myself, I can do the video edits, and I can do advanced video editing where it's like, whoa, this is sharp. You got the whole like thing there. If you look at my Instagram, you see our thing, you'll be like, oh yeah, like this guy's He's got the little things exploding and the little name bars. And so people need to learn. Uh, I think video editing is awesome because it allows people to start producing their own content and they need to start producing their own content. All right, Ryan, what's a daily habit that helps you stay focused on your goals? Ah, uh, geez, you know, daily habit. Um, it, it, my family for me, man, is everything. You know, my family keeps me focused. Uh, I don't do wing nights with the boys. I don't, uh, I don't, cl I don't go clubbing. I don't, uh, you know, the only times we go, I go out is with my wife, you know, when we travel, um, you know, my wife is my partner in, in everything. Um, you know, I don't, uh, I'm really a two gear guy. It's all family, all kids, um, all home cooking my Jamaican food, you know, and uh, my wife is Middle Eastern, so she cooks Middle Eastern food. Um, 
But that's it, man. I mean, and then after all that, all hell is is business. And people don't understand. There's no clock. I'm up at 10 o'clock at night. You know, kids wake up. They're out of bed at 7:30. I have a three-year-old and an eight-month-old, and you know, they're they're off crazy. You know, and then I come out of the office. I'll spend time. Um, they'll go down for a nap. I'll come back into the office, do some work. Um, they'll get up. I'll go out again. They'll go to bed at seven. I'll come back out. My wife and I will spend time, have some wine or something. And then we're both working sometimes right beside, you know, even if we're sitting on the couch, you know, we got our phones up because we got to handle business and we, we got to, you know, run our household and stuff like that too. So, um, it's not a, it's not a, it's, it's a lifestyle. It really is. You know, we don't feel like, oh, you're working now. No, no, like this is, we've congruent. We don't do any childcare. We're very proud of that because we really wanted to have, you know, 24 hours with our kids. Either our kids have mom, they have dad, or they have mom and dad. And for us, that's before we had kids, we talked about that. We set our lives up for that. So that being said, man, it's 24 seven. All right, Ryan, what are you curious about right now? Uh, humans, just humans, man. I, uh, I, uh, I don't understand. I'm trying to understand. Uh, I'm trying to be more empathetic to what I don't understand is, uh, I understand how humans are uh, grossly wasting time. It's your number one resource. Uh, there's nothing, you can go make all the money in the world right now and you cannot buy back your time. Like, it's crazy to me. Like, you're working at a job and you don't like it, go in, you're, you feel like a boss is uh, harassing you or belittling you, tell your boss to F off right now, do it. Play my voice doing it, do it. What the heck? If you have any respect for your mom or dad, that you know your mom especially gave birth to you have respect for your mom because your mom had the, the balls quote unquote to give birth to you to give you opportunity to to be the best version of you and you're letting some other person because they got a check over you cut down your bills go sell your sneakers go do something to change your life respect your mom respect yourself you know you're giving me your time right now I respect you for that, man. That's you're, there's nothing better you could give me right now. You give me a thousand bucks, I wouldn't care. You're giving me your time. That's taking away from your kids. Are you married? Married. From your wife, from your family. I mean, you're dedicated, man. That's the best thing. That's the best compliment you could ever give me is your time. Right. So that's what I'm curious about. Lack of people's respect for their own damn selves. <laughs> All right. Give me the best place to grab a bite in your city. Ooh. Oh. That's good. Honestly, man, my wife, my wife's kitchen. She has an Instagram page called Food for Love. Dude, my wife's cooking is the best. Like I'm talking, you're going to be burping after. You're going to be like scratching <laughs> your belly. You might start breaking out in a sweat. I mean, it's it's brutal. It's great. My <laughs> wife's right. kitchen. Food there for love. Go. We'll, we'll tag that for sure. Ryan, <laughs> uh, you gave a lot of great information, man. I love the tips and really the the clarity you provide on the marketing strategies and social media and how to understand where your client or your audience is and then using social media to help connect and engage with that individual based on that really you know you use the analogy of you know checking the weather first and then getting dressed according to the weather report uh, and it's a similar thing when it comes to social media so thank you for sharing so much information there for our listeners who want to check out your podcast and get in touch with you and learn more what is the best way for them to reach out? Uh, if you listen to podcasts anywhere you listen, iTunes, uh, Spotify, Stitcher, um, on YouTube, we're, you know, just youtube.com forward slash Ryan Holtz. Uh, Ryanholtz.ca is our website and at Ryan Holtz one on all social platforms. I can, I can attest to your listeners that if they actually reach out on Instagram or Twitter or something, we li I always get back. If they have any questions, I'll literally type my own thumbs and I get back. My engagement is probably my biggest uh, attribute online social media. I'm all about conversations and building relationships, man. There we go. So Ryan, we'll definitely make sure we link to your Instagram, your YouTube as well, uh, and your podcast for sure. Lots of great information. Really enjoyed our time today and all the great tips that you provided. I hope you have a great day. Enjoy your time with your little ones. And uh, yes, we'll be sir. In touch. Thanks for coming on Target Market Insights. Man, I appreciate you. You're the best, man. Let's We gotta stay in touch here. Absolutely. No, let's do that. Let's do that. All right, man. Take care. <laughs>